Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and it is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Stephanie Ferguson. Um, Dr. Ferguson is a global healthcare leader who has worked in 100 plus nations and has served in many prestigious and different roles. You guys have her bio in the program, and um, I encourage you to please read her bio. Um, I do want to offer a couple of updates from the information you have in her bio, however. Uh, so, in the third paragraph where uh, she, it says she was a faculty member at the Stanford University, uh, she has retired from that position. And in addition to having been a visiting fellow at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, uh, she is now currently the Professor of Practice of Health Policy and Management and is also the director of the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program. So with that, I would love to introduce Dr. Ferguson to the stage. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? Can you hear my mic? Okay, good. I'm going to start here, and then we're going to have a conversation about celebrations. That's what this is all about. And I just want to congratulate the class of 2022-2023. Stand up so I can see what you're about. Congratulations. This whole keynote is for you, but also for those of you who are here for the intensive. Uh, who's in the master's program? Stand up for me so I can see. Okay, very good. Yay. And who's in the doctorate in nurse? Uh, the DMP. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, and then who are who's in both programs, the DMP and the PhD? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Before I go any further, uh, how many people are in academia now? Okay, stand up. Let me see who's the professor. Okay. Are you, what level are you? Are you assistant? I know you, uh, legend. I see my dear colleague here. Um, assistant professor, how many assistant professors? Associate? Full professor? Okay, very good. Very good. I'm just trying to get, how many entrepreneurs in the house? If you know I'm one. Very good. Very good. Uh, how many people are working in policy? Huh? Study and policy. <laughs> All right. Anything else that I've left out when we think about the minority fellowship program? What else are, am I missing that people are doing that's worthy for everybody in the room? It's definitely the keynote speaker to know. <laughs> Throw it out. Huh? Tech, people. Tech people. What else? Practicing, Practicing nurses. Thank you. What else? Advisory council. Advisory council. What else? The graduate, thank you. What else? Anything? Board member. Board member, thank you. Alumni. Anything else? Alumni. Alu thank you, alumni. <laughs> All right, I want you to be thinking like this as I'm talking now because this is about a celebration of the milestones of your journey. Not just as a nurse, but as a human, and also as a soon to be graduate of this program. And I really want you to start thinking about uh, what conversations will you have with people that you've already met or you're gonna to continue to meet or you're gonna see and talk to about 20 years from now, what conversation would you have with them about this program? And where would you be able to mentor and, and share with people, policymakers, legislators, uh, tech companies, et cetera, to share with people sort of who you are, what you do, and what impact you have? And so I want you to think about that because every time you graduate from something, every time there's something to celebrate, that's a milestone in your life, and that's a time for you to be able to articulate where you've been and where you are now and where you're headed, okay? So that's what this is about. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some things related to this, but then I'm going to open up, and so we're doing this a little bit different so that you can ask me any questions you want to. Uh, about your career. You already have a lot of the, some of the steps with my career, but those are things that people find out about me that I want them to. And there's a lot of things I do that I don't want folk to know for lots of reasons because I don't want to be bothered with them. Okay? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, so uh, so you can talk to me, and I'm going to give you some things that I've done in my life that I think might be useful for you. I also want to thank um, SAMHSA, and I want to thank the American Nurses Association. This program, you're getting ready to go to your 50th year starting the celebration this fall. And um, when I was a, a, a minority fellow, this was back in uh, Janet. Uh, we just want to celebrate Janet and all the board of directors and all the chairs. You have your whole legacy here. Um, but it was a different program then. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I started it in 92 or 93. I, I've graduated in 95, but I walked at UVA uh, in 96, okay? And I'll tell you some more things that happened with that. But what I love about this program, it has evolved. It has evolved so much since my time. When I look back on my time, it was only like six of us. It, pretty much in the country at that point. When I look at all of you, this is what the dream was. This is what the dream was. So look at where that dream was and that vision back in those days with Dr. Hattie Bissett and then Carla Sarlin, who I was with. And, and then just think about all your directors and everybody you've been with and, and reflect on that and reflect on that because part of your journey now is also part of your education and your mentorship and who you were a fellow under the leadership of, of the Minority Fellowship Program. Because it shapes you, does that make sense? And so think on that. And then once again, I can't say enough about everybody. I just want all the people who are on the board of directors and have some type of leadership capacity for the Minority Fellowship Program, stand up. I see some of you who are on the board, who have run things in the past and still running things. Yes. And I thank you, I thank you for your leadership because think about all your legacy and, and what this moment is like. Um, one of the things that I love about all that you've been doing in the intensive is the fact that you have been learning about boldness. And we as a, a healthcare practitioners and nurses and scientists, we have to think about this. And so um, I want you to reflect and I want you to think about where you're going. And then when I wrap things up, I'm going to talk about boldness. I'm going to talk about faith. And I'm going to talk about holding all the keys in your life. Some people call it master key. That's totally not vogue now. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it's the key where you can lock and close everything. Does right. that make sense? Right. So you can name it what you want. Um, so some reflections. Let's, I won't take you back to my time when I was a fellow working on my PhD at the University of Virginia. And I was so happy. I tried for the fellowship. Um, and at that time, the transition was happening with Dr. Vincent uh, Hattie. Um, and many of you probably did not meet her because she's passed away for a while now. And, and then the, the new leadership was coming in with Carla Sarah. Um, I, ha I was already headed to the University of Virginia to get my PhD. I had been accepted to many doctoral programs in the country. But I had made the determination to get my PhD at UVA. I was already a former alum. I went to nursing school at UVA. I was president of the class of 1985. I was very active at UVA with all things, minority health, et cetera. Um, UVA uh, was a difficult place to go to school when I was undergrad, so I knew I was coming back into a similar situation with UVA. Um, and so I was ready for it, ready for it. And so when I tried for the program, I did not get accepted. I got put on the wait list. And so the bottom line is when somebody puts you on the wait list, don't wait. <laughs> okay, get your money and order and everything because whether I got the Samsung money or the A&A &A or whatever, I'm going to UVA. But it would have been nice. And so I said thank you and I really appreciate the fact that you all thought about me. Well, a couple days went by and then Dr. Sarah Lynn, uh, uh Carla, because back in those days we called each other first names. We were all very close. Wasn't that many of us. And she said, um, I need to tell you what has happened. But one of those people decided they didn't want to go. And so you were on the wait list. You were the first person on the wait list. And we'd like to offer you the opportunity to, to be, uh, 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 at that time, they called us ethnic minority <laughs> research fellows. It was long. 
I think that's still on my CV. <laughs> Nevertheless, I might need to upgrade it to MFP. Um, so long and short of the story, I was so excited because I'm like, oh, this is great. This is excellent. I will be able to have some funding. I will be able to create my own research team. I will be able to make this work a different way. And I won't have to work so much and go to the PhD program. So I was thrilled. But what happened was when I got to UVA and everything and said, you know, I'm the ethnic minority who the two of the world. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> what is that? And, um, and I was the only um, black person. I was the only African American. Not just in the, in, in the graduate school of arts and sciences with the school of nursing, but just in, in, in everything. And so it was really a, a, a difficult time. And that's what I want to say to you as you reflect. Uh, think about the times that were difficult for you. Because I know you done had some challenges. Yeah, I had a whole lot of challenges because our world, just like it is now, was very divided in those days, too. Um, this was, you know, we're looking at 90, 93 to 95. I finished the program. And then I... Um, had walked the yard, as I told you, in 96. So imagine young, intelligent, bold, beautiful, and brilliant, just like you, nurse coming in, who had worked for four governors of the Commonwealth of Virginia, head of women's and children's program. So I'm very connected. Already appointed by Governor Wilder to be on the Joint Commission for Health Care for all of the Commonwealth of Virginia as the only nurse to determine the essential health services for all of the Commonwealth of and so, you know, that scared people because it's like, she is beyond the, the, the faculty. Think about that. And, you know, I even had conversations with the dean. You're outshining me. Okay? This is my world. So you got to know your environment so you can help other people feel comfortable. And that's like nursing. It is best. Yes. <laughs> Some people who need to be locked up, here you go. <laughs> Some people who need a whole lot of meds, come on, come on. Some people who just need a nice therapy session, cup of coffee, let me talk to you so you can understand who I am. I want to get to know you, but you know, this is our life, okay? So the, it, as life went on, um, once they found out that I had gotten all the money from, uh, you know, SAMHSA and the A&A, there was a doctoral room at the university at that moment where all of us had our little carol. You know, I don't know if you went through this, but in the old days, yeah. if you were a doctoral student, you had your, yeah, you had your little seat, you know, mm -hmm. and you could lock up all your research and do everything. Yeah. And um, I got kicked out, okay, because they made a determination it was for the people who had no funding. Wow. wow. So they also had this thing that was going on that was a big thing at the University of Virginia where a doctoral student would be chosen by the provost to be with the provost up for a year and a half and shadow the provost and do everything. And a nurse had never been chosen for that since the existence of it. So I had my, uh, my uh, committee of my dissertation committee, my chair, and one of my um, members of the committee. And so they said, Stephanie, we just want you to know we nominated you for this. So we don't want you to be blindsided. But we think you're going to have a great chance to get this, and we think you are going to get it. But we know you probably will get an a interview just because you don't, things were changing there where you had to have more than just um, men. And so and there was no women, you know, back in those days, black or white, no matter what the women, uh, the ethnic background of women. All right, so I got my call to go for the interview ready. And I, I'm just, I'm happy. I'm going for the interview. And so <laughs> when I get to the interview to meet the provost and everything, the, the two gatekeeper secretaries, at that time they were also on that same day interviewing people to be the secretary to the provost. Okay, and so they said, oh, come on in here. Come on in here. <laughs> you get that? I got it. Sit down. It's like, okay. <laughs> Sit down. You need to take a test. I'm like, okay. At, what, what do you want me to take? 
and uh, typing and shorthand. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is fabulous. Now, when I was in high school, what did I do? I took I, I took shorthand. I took how to type and did everything because you never know what you got to fall back on. And so I could type 150 words a minute with not looking at it, the keys, all ten fingers and everything. So I'm like, this is <laughs> this is gonna be fantastic. So, and with the old old machine, okay. <laughs> so I'm sitting there like you know. <laughs> so they come with the glasses. Oh, that's amazing. This is excellent. You made no mistakes. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> also psych. Um, and so then the shorthand, you know, I had to put on this thing, listen to the thing, and, 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 and do the shorthand. I did it in less than five seconds. Because it was only like 40 seconds. It was little. So I was like, here you go. This is perfect. Oh, oh, we just don't know what to think. And I'm thinking... Oh, okay. Well, and so then finally the provost walks out the door and he sees all this drama. And he said, uh, Dr. Ferguson, now mind you, I'm not Dr. Ferguson. But he said, Dr. Ferguson, come on into my office. And he said, What are you all doing? And I, and I spoke right up that you have to be bold and you walk. I said, Well, they made me do the test on how to type, how many words per minute I type and how much uh, shorthand I know how to do. He said, what? <laughs> she is not here for to be the secretary. She is here to be my new fellow. So I just wanted to share with you, when people put you through things like that, don't get upset. Be grateful. We're still living in those times. Be your best. Does that make sense? And then when I came out of there, <laughs> You need I say no more. <laughs> After all of that, when I came back the next day to my office, none of them were there. Okay, so people, and even in my time, don't want all of these different things to be happening to anybody, regardless of your race, ethnicity, your creed, whatever you want to be, and whoever you are. People are tired of this kind of thing, but we're still dealing with it. So that was a little bit of my time at uh, the University of Virginia. I loved it. Because despite all of the things, I had already been there, so I knew what I was up against. And so one of the things that started my journey on that was really thinking about where did I see myself in 20 years out. So I want you to start thinking now, 20 years out. So you can put three, five, you see where I'm going. And you have to factor in getting married, uh, f the fiancés dying, and the, all, it, all kinds of stuff you got to factor in. Because life happens, <laughs> all kind of illnesses, all kind of sickness. So you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be, you know, you gotta be ready. Does that make sense? But it's also helped me to create the curriculum that I did for when I was there. So I have the three cognates in community psychology because I was at the um, school of psychology um, at UVA and also in the medicine psychiatry. The other thing too, I um, did a multicultural education, and so you know, and so you think about my career and everything, all the different things I've been doing to make those interventions. So and then also um, with nursing and the med school, um, my other cognate is health policy, health systems, and public health. Mm -hmm. And so you see, when you look at my life, you see all of that come to play. And my thing with that is know who you are and know who you are. Now, I find a lot of young people, they're all over the place. But if you want to be like we are, and be the scientist, and be the teacher, and be the this, and the entrepreneur, and the this and that, you got to have your trajectory now so that you're not going backwards like a slinky, then going forward, then going backwards, then going forward. You want to go all the way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when I was in my program, day one, um, some of my colleagues that I was in the doctoral program with said, Stephanie, you should be a White House fellow. You should be a White House fellow. I had never heard of the White House fellowship. They're like, here's the application. Read it and believe it. Okay, I said, okay, I'll read it. And so once I looked at that, you know, people like Colin Powell and different, you know, uh, different people that you see, um, like, uh, uh, on the televisions now, all, most of those people are all White House fellows. 
So I finished my PhD, applied for the White House Fellowship Program, and I encourage you all to look at that because um, I knew I was going to be a policy person doing all my site stuff, et cetera, and I was going to be doing more uh, organizational behavioral change, health system strengthening, et cetera. So that goes with all my practice. And, um, and it was very difficult to be a White House fellow, and I knew my chances, you know, but I um, also had great mentors in my life. And so I had General Hazel Johnson Brown. Oh, yes. I had Bernice Ferguson. So I had a lot of people who were like, no, you're going to get this because we're going to practice. So I want you to start thinking about who are your mentors in the past, who are your mentors now, and who do you want to be your mentor? So I'm going to tell you a little story about Hazel Johnson Brown. When I was doing the policy part of my cognate at UVA, I felt like UVA didn't have a strong policy component. But at that time, George Mason University had Hazel Johnson Brown as the head of the Center for Research, Health Policy, and Ethics. And so I called her up. And so this is another thing I want you to be bold in now. Call people up and say, I want to come be with you. I want to take your class. I'm at the University of Virginia. I'm at this level with my doctorate. I'm working with the provost, et cetera. I'm, all, I'm the one nurse at the state of Virginia that's on the Joint Commission. And I'd like to come do your summer immersion program. I know you only pick six people, but I'd like you to be one of the six. So Hazel, if you ever met General Johnson Brown, did anybody ever met her? I know some of us. Yes. Okay, so Hazel, you know, is a general. Now she is at the African American Museum. She has her own place. Mm -hmm. And Oprah paid for all of that. So if you ever get a chance, go look for her. All her stuff is there. And so when I, when, when, she talked to me and everything, and she said, well, um, well, what do you need from me? I said, well, I don't need much, but I would love to be able to stay on the campus, because, you know, young men. And, um, and also, if because I'm at a state school, if the tuition could be waived. <laughs> and she said, she, she said uh, let, me, let me think about all of this, and I am just, uh, I'm honored to know you. So she went back and did her research and stuff, and she called me back immediately. And she said, um, you are already accepted in the program. Um, and you, you will be one of my fellows, but you're going to be faculty. And so when you really think about my career, I ended up, after I finished the White House Fellowship, I went to Howard University, but then I left Howard, and I went to be at George Mason University in the Center for Research in Health Policy and Ethics. And I also became the chair of the Ph.D. program. So think about in health policy. So think about where you are now, who you're meeting, because all of that now is going to move fast forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you, I want you to be bold in who you want to be around, who you want to be with. Um, I don't know too many people who um, would say no to you, okay? I mean, even myself, if you ever want to talk to me, you know you can. Some of you I've already talked to. But most people... I find um, love the person who's just graduating or is in school. And it gives you cachet to say, you know, I'm at X, Y, Z. I'm doing X, Y, and Z. La, 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 la. And then most people are like, okay, I'd love to know you. Let's set up a time. Let's talk. So those are just some nuggets to let you know now that you have to really work on your communication and everything and be bold in that ask. You will not go far if you don't learn how to do the ask. If you ask, you will receive. And if you have that mentality, you, you will do this. So your homework assignment is reflection. Now, we all know how important is reflection is. We're in a rapid world now. But you have to stop and pause. And you have to have your notebooks. And you have to write. Have to write. One way to get more people to be in the MFP is to write. And I know Janet, look, I, I write, I write, I tell, I write. If you want to be the authority, you have to be the author. And so otherwise, you, what? You're Dr. Doohiggy. <laughs> right up there with Doolittle. Um, and so you don't want, you want, you got to get that. But the best way to be a great writer is to be a great thinker. And the best way to become a great thinker is to be a great person who reflects and to really do a deep dive on what are the things that I remember that happened to me, how did I come over that, 
How did I go from X to Z to Z to Y to this and that, even in adversity? How might I be able to make this turn around for me? So keep that in mind. And then um, moving onward, I can't say enough about having not only mentors, but having coaches. Now, I'm an executive coach. You know I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I have a multi-million dollar company. I'm faculty at Harvard. Every place I've been, I had the company now since um, grad, uh, under, uh, when I went to get my master's at VCU, because I, I come from a very entrepreneurial um, family. And this is how I think about money. I'm not trying to be poor. <laughs> <laughs> Just not. So look at your name and say, I'm not going to be poor. <laughs> and this is why I think like this. It takes money to make money and to be able to take and bring that money back into the communities. Community. So you are the financier of social entrepreneurism and change and not the person getting the hand out all the time. Yeah. If you want to change the game on biometrics and social, all the things we are studying and doing, then you got to pay to play. That's number one. But you also got to pay people to do what it is you want them to do. And so um, think about this as you, as you move forward and what you want to do with your skills. You've got mad skills. We're going to have 800 some thousand nurses down just because of retirement in the United States of America by 2027. Now, very few people want to be like us, taking care of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't want to be like us. And so you are, the, all your knowledge and skills, you should have it. your own AI companies. You should do digital health. You should put that in motion now worldwide. Worldwide. And that's what I did. Once I finished my uh, master's degree, and I come from a very entrepreneurial family. That I was in, at the Medical College of Virginia down in Richmond. And I, that's as a clinical nurse specialist, perinatal, neonatal clinical nurse specialist. So, you know, when I look at all the stuff I'm going on with black maternal child health and then all the things right now, I don't care what your religious beliefs are, but reproductive health for, for women, you know I just want to holler. And I love people. We don't know why this is happening to the black mothers. Right. <laughs> Let, give me, let me give you a list. <laughs> let me give you a list. So anyway, think about your career now. I want you to reflect on it. What else can I do while I am still professor? Now think about me. I'm at Harvard. What, does all Har what do all Harvard professors have? They have their own companies, big time. And they're the head of this. You, you put that in your contract. You own it. Not a penny. Thank you for sharing. It's great to be here. But this is the things you won't have. None of my IP. None of my intellectual property. None of my writings. And what happens, though, when most people go and get the job, they act, they're so oh, happy to be here. Oh, life, life is good. And then basically, I look at people's contracts, they're like, you just gave your whole research program away to that university that you, you did your whole dissertation on. Let's go back with some lawyers. <laughs> Let's redo it. Let's redo it, right? Let's redo that contract. But you hear where I'm saying now, you've got a lot of things now you want to do. And the other thing, I've always wanted to be global. And when I was at, um, with, when I was a White House fellow, I was very global. With, uh, I was with Clinton, President Clinton and Donna Shalala who was the head of um, HHS. And um, so as a White House fellow, I represented um, the administration um, post-apartheid and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission with Bishop Tutu and everything. Nurse, black American, nurse. And you know, people are like, this is amazing. That, you know, first I'm a woman, but then too, look where the government sent to be there to hear all the things from Nelson Mandela's wife, Winnie, and to hear people say, yes, I did this. Yes, I this killed this person. Yes, I did a whole village. Yes, I did this. And now let's be friends. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So I um, just want you to think about how can you move whatever it is you want to do in your career worldwide. 
Now, I'm one of the few people in the world who've worked in about 161 nations now on behalf of the United Nations, the World Bank, WHO, the World Health Organization, the International Council of Nurses. It's not just USA, okay? We live in a global world. I want you to think global. When you think about the diaspora, for those of us in here who are beautifully African and black, you can call yourself what you want. But if you think about that, think about what they need now. How might you go back and do and rebuild and help them versus let them be brain drained out of their nations mm -hmm. to come and work in our facilities for nothing? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the boldness of the policy. So the other thing I just want to uh, talk to you about, and then I'm going to open it up and, and end on this. Um, I want you to be really, really bold in your life. Really bold. Have no shame. Speak up. Speak out. Be the activist. Do this, because no one else will do it if it's not us. The other people will get their PhDs and everything, and be like, yes, check off. This is my pinnacle. I used to have that when I taught doctoral students. I'm like, why are you in the program? This is my pinnacle. <laughs> okay, all right, we got a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things it, it, when I used to teach at the doctoral level for nursing, um, I do, there's a nice thing, and I want you to look into this, and maybe Janet, I know some people who can teach this, is career topography. And it's a big thing for people like ourselves where you map out your whole career, you see what your knowledge, skills, and abilities are your competencies, and you do the trajectory of all your writing and everything. And it really lets other people see who you are, what you are. But do a little research on that career topography. It's actually quite good for those of you who are scientists and going to be practitioners and scientists, which is this whole world, OK? Um, so be bold. Be bold. Be beautifully brilliant. Be bold and beautifully brilliant. I always say it's B to the three. Bold beautiful and brilliant forever, forever, and feel good about that and walk into this journey and walk into it so that you know that you know who you are and you are comfortable in your own skin. Does that make sense? Be bold. Ask for what you need with the mentality that I'm going to receive it. The next point is having faith in yourself. You know, we got a lot of people now, and when I talk to them and everything, they have no uh, center. And so without, you know, what I mean by that is the, what, what is your North Star? What, is, what are you following? Now, if you say to me, I was following the monkey, because, mm -hmm. you, you know, we psych nurses, we were like, okay, like, let's talk about the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and with no, like how I am now, no emotion. Um, but the issue is, you've got to have something in your life that is your anchor, that is your center. Now, for me, I, I'm a woman of faith, and so, and I have no shame with it. I'm a Christian. Um, I, I, you know, somebody said to me the other day that they thought the aliens were going to come and it was going to change everything, and it was going to mess up all the religions and everything because it's not how the creation was. And I said back to the person, because this person is big time in the government, you better get that message right. Because Jesus still works for me, but I'm just saying, uh, you better get that message right. Because you, everything has some creation. Does that make sense? No matter what your religious beliefs are or not. Because we are practicing now in the world where nobody wants to hear about nothing related to faith. But I am going to boldly today say to you, it is not about you. It is not about you. And some of the people who always feel like it's about them, watch their career. They don't do much at all. But people who really have a sense of who they are, what centers them, whatever that is, even the monkey, <laughs> they are able to do great works. Does that, so what I'm saying to you is have faith in yourself and understand what that faith is within you. And, and, and be, believe in something other than yourself. You know, by the time I finished at, at UVA, when it was time for me to go graduate, I was like, look, I got my degree. I ain't, I'm not going to walk. I, I've been through hell here. 
And, but I had one of my colleagues um, who uh, was with me through it all. You know, the first day we went to class at UVA, the one professor said to us, you don't look like the two of you should be PhDs. Now, this is me. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> but she was from the backwoods of Appalachia in Virginia, and she was disabled. And <laughs> when the class was over, she said, I'm going to sue all of them. <laughs> and she said, Stephanie, you are a witness. This is me. <laughs> Look, I ain't getting into this because this is the difference between you in the backwoods of Appalachia, me in the center of Virginia black. We've been used to all of this. We, we don't have, we, we expect that people will look at you and say, you should not be this. I know this is, it's foreign for you because you're white, you're disabled, you're this and that and that, privileged. But look, that's your lawsuit. <laughs> you do the lawsuit, you know? And, and I'm just gonna enjoy this because in my life, when it's all said and done, I will be able to tell young PhD beautifully brilliant and bold students that story. And because that's exactly what you'll be dealing with from a lot of people, but they won't say it out loud. So be bold, be bold, be bold and brilliant and beautiful. That's number one. And have faith in yourself. That's number two. And the last thing is you hold the keys to, to your success. You hold it. Sometimes I get the people and they're like, nobody never let me do this and this and that. And I stop them right there. No. What is your responsibility in this? Write me down five things. I'm going to come back and see you tomorrow. You know, that's the second nurse. <laughs> you can reflect on this all night. Try to get your food, vegetables, and sleep. But I want you to come back with me. What's your role in your career? Because you hold the key. Does that make sense? And when you have the primary key, as I'm saying now, versus the master, you have that, that key will allow you to lock out negativity. It will allow you to open up new doors. Does that make sense? But it allows you to do all things. And so you have the keys to your kingdom that you are going to create. Does that make sense? And so remember that. So I'm very happy to be with you. I hope that you have enjoyed some of what I've shared with you today. But I want to open it up for a conversation now because we have time. And Janet and I designed it like this, so you can ask me anything, because you see how I am. If I can't answer it, I'll just tell you. <laughs> but you can ask me anything about your life, your career, where you're headed, what recommendations I have for you. And then we also have a lot of saints in the room, I'm looking at them, who can also add to the conversation, who also have the lived experience of what you're getting ready to complete to also add to the conversation. Life is about conversations when we're celebrating. And we're celebrating today. And this is a moment of faith, F-A-T-E. We are here at this day in time by no coincidences. Does that make sense? Yeah. We are here intentionally, on purpose, because this is our time. So I see your hand. Tell me who you are. Tell me where you're from.